In this week's PowerPoint lecture, we're going to be looking at the birth of the church. So in the previous week, we looked at who was Jesus, the Messiah of Nazareth. And so now we're looking at this new community that started that's following Jesus and how this grew from 12 fishermen to uh, something that is a multinational, multi-ethnic uh, organization, body, um, a family group um, that's been going on for centuries, uh, for 2,000 years that encompasses over a billion people today. So we're going to look at basically the story of how did we get from 12 to billions today. Um, it's a very exciting story. Um, and so let's get started. All right. Now, before we dive into the new content, uh, looking at the book of Acts and the rise of the church that followed Jesus Christ, let's go ahead and remind ourselves some of the stuff we talked about last week and looking at the Gospels. So we saw that God comes in the flesh in the form of Jesus to fulfill the promise of Genesis chapter 3 as one who will confront evil and defeat it by mutual self-destruction. He lays his life down, allows evil to kill him as the means of killing evil. We also see that Jesus acts as the true Israel, what the whole Old Testament track in this family group known as the Israelites and how they mess up, but they have these promises that God is going to work through them. We see Jesus uh, fulfill what Israel was supposed to be. He was the better Israel, and he fulfills the promises of Abraham of gathering together a family who was going to be a blessing upon the world as he himself was a blessing upon the nations um, in his earthly life. We also saw that Jesus fulfilled the promise made to David in 2 Samuel chapter 7, that one day David would have a descendant who would be this Messiah, who would rule over all the nations, who would bring peace upon the world, who would set things right um, and bring a relationship back between humanity and God. And we see Jesus act as the true Messiah. He's brought this relationship back and he now rules over all the world, gradually setting it right again. We also saw that by his faithfulness, Jesus launched his upside down kingdom into the world with this new ethic that they were choosing to love and listen to God. Um, and by that, in turn, love others as that transformational love is brought into their life once their sin is dealt with. And so that happens in the faithfulness of Jesus um, to bring about the forgiveness of sins and then to launch them into the world. And that's where we, we see that he, as the true humanity, uh, true human being, has invited others to join in what he started. And so we see that the Gospels kind of end with this uh call to action upon its readers that once we have come to believe that this Jesus is real, that he is um, not just in a historical sense, because that's irrefutable. There's so much historical evidence of a true historical Jesus walking the world. But we believe the spiritual truth that, that he's the Messiah, um, that we are therefore then invited into believing um, and, and sharing uh, in his mission and his purpose to redeem the world as we go out to uh, love as he is loved, to share his message to, um, that he's now in charge and we live under the will. And that's what the gospels kind of call uh, for the readers and for the church to follow. And so we come now to uh, what's going to be in the book of Acts, looking at um, how does this people um, who once were far away from God, who are now in this relationship with God, how do they now live in this world that doesn't agree with them as they try to follow the teachings of Jesus and believe that Jesus is the one in charge? Um, it's a really interesting story. But before we get to that, we need to look at some of the dynamics of Jesus' kingdom that makes it so countercultural for the day. Now, what Jesus did and what his followers did right after him was rather dramatic and it was um, completely countercultural. And the reason being is because it has a couple different elements that were unlike any other uh, society or organization or community, especially in the first century and in some ways still today. So one of the dynamics was that sins are forgiven which basically was saying, hey, all that you have done wrong in this world, all the ways that you've gone against uh, the will of God, those are now forgiven when you've entered into this new community. And that was rather dramatic because every other um, idol, temple worship, um, deity um, in that day and age religious system 
all involved um, humanity coming and trying to earn the favor of the gods. And here um, we see there's something backwards where God has come and dealt with that problem and he has come to desire to dwell among a restored people. And that's something that's also dra uh, rather important for this dynamic of this community is that here is God, he has come and sought out the humanity rather than waiting on humanity to come to him like every other religion. This is a God who desires to dwell among a restored people. Remember, we've seen that theme constantly throughout the Bible. Uh, it starts out in the garden, um, then humanity messes that up. We saw it in the tabernacle and the temple experience. We see it in uh, the way the language used to describe Jesus and how God took on flesh because God wanted to dwell among us. He wanted to tabernacle among us. And so now the dynamics of Jesus' kingdom is that God has finally fulfilled that among a restored people that he lives among. And this is an invitation that's inclusive of all types of people uh, from all walks of life to come and experience this relationship with God and to become who they are always meant to be as they've been transformed by the love of God to then go out and share that love um, with others. And so this is a, a counter-cultural group of people in the first century world that really starts to upset things. Some people don't like it. Some people love it. Um, it really upsets the balance. It threatens a lot of the way things are done. Um, and it builds something uh, over and over again, which um, is rather uh, intense. And I hope that's something that we're going to see a little bit more in this lecture, exactly what it is that this community is building, um, you know, and what their goal and purpose now is. All right. So what exactly is the book of Acts? Well, in short, it comes right after the story of the Gospels, and it's tracking how these 12 disciples that Jesus spent three or four years investing in, building uh, this new community with them, how after Jesus dies and is resurrected and he launches them into the community and then he ascends uh, to his throne, something we're going to look at here in a minute, uh, they take this message of Jesus and they go and they spread it. And the book of Acts is tracking how 12 men grew into a community that was multi-ethnic, multi-generational, and it grew from Jerusalem out into Judea, out into Samaria, and eventually to the ends of the earth, and how it eventually spreads to where we are today in the modern day world. All right, so first off, what exactly is the book of Acts? Well, it's the part two to a two-part story that was told in the Gospel of Luke. So they're written by the exact same guy. And he's writing to give this historical account of how this message of Jesus was spread and how it created pockets of new humanity communities called churches in the first few decades after Jesus' resurrection. And it's tracking the story of how this kind of spread from 12 little guys into um, the church that we kind of know of today and so it doesn't cover all of church history but it covers at least the the first few decades and um it's all about this community that's trying to listen and love god you know like how the the story of god how god wanted a family that would do this well here's this new community that is now striving to do this as they listen and follow the teachings of jesus it's now this book is um, sometimes called the Acts of the Apostles. Um, it's better understood to be known as the Acts of the Holy Spirit or the Acts of Jesus because it's still continuing the same story. It's, it's showing us what is Jesus now doing in this new community, which he's starting. Um, a lot of the characters are known as the Apostles, but there's still this background uh, language being used of here's Jesus kind of guiding uh, these apostles to, to go out and spread this message of Jesus and what he's done and, and how this starts changing people's lives. And so that's what the book of Acts is kind of tracking is the birth of the church and how it sort of came to be. So the book of Acts opens up right where the Gospel of Luke left off. And we've got a resurrected Jesus. He's meeting with his followers. He's telling them and explaining to them all that's happening and how he's the Messiah. And then he launches them out. And it's really important that we look at what Jesus has to say here because the first few verses of the book of Acts kind of lays out like a table of contents for how the rest of the book is broken down. So it begins where in verse chapter six or verse one of chapter 
or chapter 1, verse 6. I apologize for that. Where chapter 1, verse 6, Jesus, we, we find that he is, uh, they're all together, him and all the disciples, and, and they ask him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Now, that's kind of important to understand because, remember, a Jewish mindset in the day and age was that God was going to send a Messiah who was going to defeat the enemy and establish his kingdom for all the, the good people of God, right? And so they're thinking that means that God was going to come in, he was going to defeat the Romans, and he's going to create a Jewish empire, right? So that's what they think the Messiah is going to do. And so they're asking Jesus, and he's like, now you've been resurrected. Are you now going to basically lead us into battle and to take out the Romans and establish a Jewish empire? They're, they're thinking this is what it means for Israel to be restored. But here's how Jesus responds to them. In verse 7, he said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father is fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Now that's kind of important. What Jesus basically said, he's like, hey, don't think like that because you think this is all about the restoration of Israel. And he's showing them that that's already happened. Because in the Gospels, he was the true Israel. He was what Israel was supposed to be. So they're sitting there thinking, hey, are you going to rescue and redeem Israel? And he's kind of like, guys, that's already happened in my life. I, I am the true Israel. And you need to go out and proclaim the good news of the kingdom of Jesus into this world until all the corners of the earth know that Jesus is now charged. So this is kind of important in the understanding of the first century world. So when a king or someone came into power in the first century world, like an emperor, what they would do is they would send out uh, what's known as heralds to go to all the four corners of their kingdom and announce what was known as the good news. Um, which is also translated as the gospel. See, the word gospel is always tied to the proclamation of a coming king, that a king has been named. Because in the first century world, they understood anarchy is really bad, and that it's good to have a new king, even if it's in a corrupt monarchy or anything like that. The people always celebrate, saying, hey, we have a ruler over us who's going to meet on our behalf, who's going to fight for his people, and things like that. Right. And so here, Jesus, he's proclaiming, he's like, you need to go to the four corners of the earth. He's claiming ownership and uh, dominion over the entire cosmos. He's like, you need to go to everyone you can find and announce this message. Hey, the king has taken his throne. And there's an interesting plot here on how Jesus is kind of given the strategy and how this is going to spread. He's like, hey, start in Jerusalem. Start where I was killed. Start where the, the central hub and the, the city of God was. And then spread out to the surrounding country. And then go to Samaria. Go to a different country. And then eventually go to the ends of the earth. And that's how the book of Acts is broken down. So the first few chapters, we see the church in Jerusalem. And then we see them in Judea and Samaria. They start to spread out. And then we're going to eventually see them reach the ends of the earth. And so the, the book of Acts is kind of following this formula that, that Jesus lays out to his uh, followers. right? But there's also something else that's really interesting in this. He's promising that his followers will be like a new temple of God's presence in the world. right? He, he's like, hey, I'm going to be with you and you're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And that's crucial because if you remember in the Old Testament, anytime the Holy Spirit came upon something like the tabernacle, the temple, it was a big showing of fire and power. And it was a big way of God saying, this, this is where my presence is going to live. And so Jesus is telling them, he's like, God's going to dwell with you. God's going to be in your life. He's going to be acting through you. The Holy Spirit is going to be a part of who you are to the core of your being now as you go out and share this message that Jesus is now king of the universe because he has conquered death on the cross. And so this is what the book of Acts is tracking is this people group who are going out and doing this very thing, proclaiming that they are sharing this message by the power of God um, that, that Jesus is now the king. And so we're going to follow through from here on out to kind of track, okay, this people, this, um, this minority organization, uh, population, community, whatever you want to call it, this minority group of people, uh, who, they go out sharing this message and how it kind of upsets the balance of culture in that day and age. All right, so after Jesus kind of lays out his big strategy on how he wants his 
followers to go out and share the message that he's now the king of the universe and all that. It, we read something really interesting in verse 9. And it says that when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. And so here's this image of the ascension of Jesus. And it's kind of important that we just make quick mention of it because it's in some ways is very comedic um, and how it's rendered nowadays. So you look at like Middle Eastern drawings and artwork of the ascension of Jesus, for instance, and you get all these disciples and they're just, you know, staring up at the sky, all, um, shocked. And then above them is a pair of feet that's just hanging from the top of the portrait. They're kind of funny photos if you look at it. Um, some movies, they uh, do this differently. Some, they have Jesus. He kind of hops onto a cloud and he flies off as if he's like the silver surfer uh, from the Marvel Universe. Or some people have him just disappear from sight. It, it's really confusing. We have to understand that the language of the first century, they're trying to explain something that's unexplainable. And they're at the same time trying to allude back to uh, ref, uh, a verse in Daniel chapter 7. So in Daniel chapter 7, um, you have the prophet Daniel, um, and he has this vision of what's known as the Son of Man ruling the world from heaven beside God. And so here is Luke writing in the book of Acts, and he's referencing back that event. He's basically saying now Jesus is taken on his throne, um, and he's sitting beside God in the throne room of heaven, right? Um, and it's it's language that kind of says, hey, Jesus is not physically present here anymore, but he hasn't died. He's just gone to be in that mysterious place where God is, um, where God rules uh, the cosmos. Um, and it's a reference that this is truly the Son of Man. This was truly the Messiah. And it's also showing the authority which Jesus has to, to make decisions upon um, how people live and their morality and how culture and um, every little aspect of it is running because he's now the one sitting on the throne, right? And so this is why the book of Acts is claiming about Jesus and why the disciples then go out to do the things that they do that we're going to read of because they're going from this uh, mindset that they are understanding that Jesus is now in charge of everything and that they live to bring his will and his voice and his uh, desires into the world as his uh, as the people go out to share the blessing of God into this world. All right, so the disciples leave the mountain after they're given their orders by Jesus, and they, they go back into Jerusalem, and, and they're um, trying to figure out, okay, what does God want us to do next? But they've been told to wait. They're waiting for what's called the Holy Spirit to come upon them, and they're not quite sure at the moment what that looks like, so they're just... Uh, quietly waiting and some time goes by and an event called Pentecost comes up. Now Pentecost was a festival of the Jews. Um, it's more commonly thought of as the festival. It was like a harvest festival shortly after the time of pa Passover. But it's actually, um, while it is that, it's also much more than that. It's also the celebration of when Moses came down from the mountain with the Ten Commandments and the law on how the people should live as God's people that happened in the Old Testament, right? And so this is a very special event, right? And then we get told of this remarkable moment that happens that kind of sparks and explodes the church from here on out, and it changes history, and it's in, recorded to us in Acts chapter 2, um, beginning at verse 1. Let me go ahead and read it for us. It says, When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. That's referring to the disciples. And then verse 2, it says, And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So what's going on here is kind of remember in the Old Testament how God's presence would fall upon the tabernacle and the temple and, and it's the form of a mighty rushing wind and fire and just awe. Well, that's what's happening now upon the individuals where God is now choosing to make his temple, not in tents, not in buildings, but to make his temple, his presence, the place where he is worshipped and his authority is um, on the throne. It's in the hearts of these disciples, these followers of Jesus. And this kind of changes things. It changes even how they interact in the world. Because we see that they're, as they're filled with the Holy Spirit, they begin to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. 
And then verse 5 says, Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together, and they were bewildered, because each one was hearing them, them the disciples, speak in his own language. And they are amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? How is it that we hear each of us hear each of us in his own native language? So here's this uh, large crowd that forms of people who are speaking multiple different languages. And what they're hearing are the disciples when they talk. Everyone from all these different languages are hearing in their own languages. Now, there's in this day and age, a lot of denominations, there's a lot of speculation on this. But uh, let's just think back to the grand narrative scripture, what's going on here. So if you remember in Genesis chapter 11, there's this story of the Tower of Babel where humanity tried to dethrone God. And, and the way God ended that was by confusing the languages of the people and scattering them. Now we're seeing a reversal of that. Now they're, we're seeing a multitude of people representing multiple different nations who are all gathering in one spot. And then they're hearing in their own languages the, the word of God, the authority, the will of God being proclaimed to them. So if you see that, it's a complete reversal of Genesis chapter 11. Genesis chapter 11, which was one of the most heinous acts of rebellion against God, is now being reversed in this moment as the word of God, the will of God, the, the message of God is now being proclaimed and all the nations are now hearing it. All of them are now being invited to, to come and to be part of this, uh, this new community that's being started here. It's a fulfillment of God's prophecy to unite all people in his messianic kingdom. Remember, that was something that was promised to Abraham. You're going to have a descendants more numerous than the stars, and they're going to be a blessing to all the nations. And we see that this is a God who wants to bring all of humanity back into relationship with him after he's redeemed them. Here is the fulfillment of that prophecy where God is now uniting all people together under the, the banner of the messianic uh, kingdom that is started in Jesus as the Messiah. So at the preaching that happens in the story of Pentecost, when the disciples have the Holy Spirit fall upon them, we see this massive uh, following that starts to happen, where all of a sudden, all those who are hearing decide to uh, change their ways, uh, to repent of their sins, and then to come to Jesus, uh, to say, hey, I want to follow Jesus. And so right then we see that the church is really born. And we get this massive um, activity of people getting baptized, which basically means that people are um, immersing themselves in water to just say, hey, I am choosing to declare in the public uh, uh, viewing of others that my allegiance lies with Christ and I will listen and love him. I will follow him. I will be one of his disciples. And so this new community is formed. It's a church. And, and we find that they, uh, they start to operate a little bit differently. They they meet in the temple, but they also meet in their homes. And then they're in this tightly bonded community where they, they share uh, resources together. They love one another. They take care of each other. Um, and they, they commit themselves to trying to learn what the uh, apostles have to teach them about Jesus and what it means to, to follow Jesus. And then they go out into the community to be a blessing using what they've learned to, to make the community around them a little bit better. But... While this seems wonderful and glorious, we find that this kind of upsets the balance of things. You see, Rome wasn't upset with having a majority of different religions. That was fine. In fact, their society kind of operated and depended upon a plurality of different religions. And some of that was even in part in the Jewish community, though the Jewish community was very adamant about monotheism and things like that. Uh, there's only one God and it's Yahweh. They still understood, hey, there's this other system. But this is different. Here we have Jews who look like they're leaving the Old Testament, the way of the Old Testament, to follow Jesus, who uh, the rest of the community does not accept as the Messiah. And this is, seems kind of dangerous. This makes this new community look like a threat. And let me explain why. From the Jewish perspective, the Jews are thinking, hey, we ended up in exile. We ended up being oppressed by Rome because we did not listen and love God, because we turned away to other gods, because we did not follow God. And by the first century world, the Jews got incredibly radical about this. 
Israelites. That's why you have the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and, and they uh, constantly harassing Jesus. And, and what we're going to see in the rest of the book of Acts, they're going to constantly harass the church, even to violent means of killing um, some of the followers, just like they killed um, Jesus, because they're sitting there thinking, we've got to stop this. Otherwise, if we fall in the same mistake we did before, something worse is going to happen to us than we are than the situation we're in right now. And so this creates a lot of tension where this community, this church community is trying to say, hey, we haven't left the faith. We've merely accepted the fact that Jesus was the Messiah that we've been hoping for. And so this puts them at animosity with their own Jewish people. How this affects the Roman world is that the, uh, while Rome, like I said, operated on a system where they're comfortable with the plurality of worship of different deities, they all said, hey, you can worship anyone you want, but you have to recognize Caesar, Roman Caesar, Augustus Caesar, is the true God of all things. He's the one you have your ultimate allegiance to. He's the one you must listen to above any other deity. And so here's this new community who are gathering together and say, yeah, we're actually going to worship the homeless man that you killed. And we're going to say that he is the Messiah, that he's the true ruler of all the nations. You can see why that would put them a little bit opposition against Rome itself. So this is a community that are trying to, to love one another. They're trying to make the community around them better. But because of their message, they're not very well liked. They're harassed. They're beaten. Some of them are in prison. They're seen as a threat to the status quo. Now, while we looked at how the rest of the community saw this new Jesus movement community, um, it's important to understand how this Jesus community operated internally. And so that's kind of revealed to us in Acts chapter 4, verse 32, which tells us now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were given their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. So what we're seeing that internally, this new community is doing what the old temple community was supposed to be doing, but we're failing at. The old temple was supposed to be a place of hope. It was supposed to be a place where people who were in need would come and find the generosity and resources of God. They would find his healing presence. They would find his love. But the old temple had not become that. This was partially what ended up leading to the, the death of Jesus because Jesus spoke out against this old temple. He called it a fraud. He, he called it corrupt. He said, look, this was meant for something good, but it's turned into a den of robbers. It's, it's become something heinous from what it was supposed to do because it all became about power and money um, and control. Um, and, and here's this new community who is now doing what the old temple was supposed to be doing. They had become the wellspring of God's generosity and healing presence upon the world. Now, while internally this new community was living out the, the merits and the actions that the old temple was supposed to be doing, we find, once again, this does not go well among especially the Jewish community. right? And we get that clearly shown to us in a story about a guy named Stephen. So Stephen is a member of the Jewish community. Um, he's very uh, adamant about preaching about how Jesus is the Messiah. Um, and it starts to upset some people. And he gets arrested for his preaching. And he's brought before the same council that killed Jesus. And they're basically telling him, hey, tell us your defense. Um, tell us why we should not kill you. And so Stephen, in his own defense, retells the entire Jewish history. But he's pointing out several different things in his story. He's identifying um, how the story is all leading to Jesus, but he's also pointing out how God's people refused to listen to those who were sent by God. So he looks at Moses, and he looks at um, some of the prophets and other individuals, and how God sends these people to win the heart of the, the people. And and the people of God, the Jews, always turn against those who are sent by God. And so God finally sends Jesus. He sends his own son. But the people refuse to listen. They turn their backs on him. They killed him. And Stephen's saying this to the very people who orchestrated the death of Jesus, right? So that's 
that's kind of brave. You're looking at people who, who just killed your Messiah, and you're telling them, hey, you are going to fail. You did this. You're a loser. You're the one who is guilty, not me. Right? You don't say these things in front of uh, this kind of crowd. But Stephen does. He points out their shame. He points out their sin. And then he presents Jesus as the king. And the people, this council who are listening, they get so angry. They take him. They drag him outside the city. They grab large stones and they beat him to death with them. They, they stone him. And Stephen is killed. And he's the first martyr of the church. He's the first Christian to die. And this kind of really changes things. Um, we're going to look at that a little bit next in the next slide. But this kind of sparks something an, uh, new, a new way of, for all these other communities that don't like this new Christian community of how they're now allowed to react to this new Jesus uh, movement, and it's not a very pretty image. So Stephen is arrested and he's killed. And it's really tragic because he was this awesome dude who was doing awesome things, who was making the world around him better, and he was proclaiming this message of hope that now Jesus is on his throne, Jesus is in charge of all things, and Jesus is inviting people to join in and being partners with him and fixing this world and things like that. And, and and he's arrested for this, and he's eventually stoned, and he's killed, and it's really depressing. And it seems like, okay, here's this community that's just trying to love one another, love their community, love God, um, make the world better. And they're so hated for this, so much so that, that now one of their own is killed. Now it seems to just open the floodgates of chaos in this Jerusalem setting. In fact, we're told in in uh, chapter 8, verse 1, that there rose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And so what begins here is a, a hunting down of Christians by both the Jews and what's going to be later seen in the Gentiles as well, where everyone's like, we don't want these people to come in. We don't want these people to upset the natural status quo of things, but we don't like their message. And so there's this permission almost being granted here to hunt them down. But here's the interesting thing about this. As the Christians are scattering away from Jerusalem, they're running for their lives trying to get away, we're told in verse 4 that those who were scattered went about preaching the word. And so this is all going back to remember Jesus' statement. He's like, you're going to start in Jerusalem, but then you're going to end up in Judea and Samaria and the ends of the earth. And so this is while this is probably taking place maybe a couple of years, maybe a decade after Jesus has said this word, now we're seeing that this little church body in Jerusalem is now being forced to spread out according to Jesus' plan. And as they're spreading, they continue to tell the word that Jesus is now in charge. He's now uh, one of victory over evil. He's now king of the universe. And then they're inviting people to come and follow this Jesus and turn away from uh, their sin and to, to commit their lives to Jesus, to, to be in this relationship with him, to follow him. Um, and so here's this, uh, it's rather unique, where Jesus is using the chaos that the world throws against his community as the means of growing this. It goes back to that, that theme we kind of see throughout the Bible, that God's way of dealing with evil is oftentimes to lead evil into its own self-destruction. It happened, um, it was promised in the Old Testament. Um, we saw it in Jesus that he defeated death and evil on the cross by leading it to its own destruction, by laying his life down as the sacrifice. And now we see that this is how God continues to build even this church community, that when evil rises up, against his message of goodness, it's by that means of evil rising up that the message of goodness is spread, that hope uh, is extended out and more people hear the message. It's really uh, an interesting plot development that we're kind of seeing here. The result after Stephen is martyred is that the church is forced to spread because then they all have a big target on their heads. And so this early church community uh, leaves Jerusalem and they, they scatter to the four winds. They go all across Judea and Samaria. And in this, 
as we looked at in the previous slide, God is kind of working to to create and spread and uh, mold these people into uh, people who are supposed to be reached in the world. It's all in accordance to the, the roadmap that Jesus laid out in uh, Acts chapter 1. And so from this, we get this account where the church starts to shift in their philosophy and their uh, identity in a couple of different ways because they go from a purely Jewish um, culture to all of a sudden they've seen how Gentiles are coming into this. And so this is going to present a new time of challenges that are um, from opposing philosophy and conduct. And, and we get to these stories of every time the church goes into a new town, it, it's rubbing shoulders um, against the the culture, the economy, the politics, the philosophy of that particular place. And we get to see these narratives like in the when they go to Athens and when they go to Ephesus and um, Lacedonia and these other locations, they're all vastly different from themselves and how the, the gospel interacts with these locations. But this all kind of presents a unique challenge. While the church in some parts seems to be open to being multi-ethnic and international, it still has this question of, well, who exactly is really allowed to be part of this, all right? And so we, we get this question that's brought in while all these people seem to be wanting to be a part of it, are they allowed to be a part of it? And that's really the question that starts to develop in, in this portion of the book of Acts between chapters 8 and 12. As I said in the previous slide, chapters 8 through 12 is really addressing the topic that the early church was inclusive to all sorts of life and all sorts of people to come and, and to surrender their lives under the lordship of Jesus. And so we see first the account of the Samaritans, those uh, hated half-Jews is what they're known as. They're seen as, at one point, the enemies of the Jews. But now, in this encounter, in this new community, they're invited to come and be part of the family that we see that they're coming to accept that Jesus is the Messiah. And so that's the first inbreaking of those who are outside of the Jewish community coming to have faith in Jesus. And then next we see Saul of Tarsus. Now, Saul was a Jew. In fact, he was hired pretty much by the temple to go from house to house and drag Christians kicking and screaming in chains back to prison to be executed. He was a horrible individual um, in that regard. Um, and he was doing it because he thought he was saving the Jewish nation by doing that, right? And we looked at that previously. Um, and if you have questions about that, we can look at it more. But basically, he thought he was a good guy. He thought he was trying to save the nation by purging them of this, uh, what he saw was this cult, which he saw was a threat to their way of life and society. But he too comes to, to be a believer, and he's a later a missionary named Paul. And so we see, okay, now the Samaritans are coming to faith, and now even those who are an enemy of the church are coming to, to surrender their lives to, uh, to Jesus, uh, to accept him and believe that he's the Messiah, and to listen and love God as they, they seek to follow um, Jesus. And, and so we've got the Samaritans, we've got uh, even the enemies of the church, and then we get this encounter where Peter is invited into the home of a Roman centurion. Get that. He's invited into a home of Roman centurion, a place where no Jew would ever go. He's at the doorsteps of a guy whose job was to oppress the Jews, and we get this amazing encounter where Peter has been invited in this moment. He's, he starts preaching the gospel, telling about how Jesus is the Messiah, how Jesus has won a victory even over Rome. And we're told in, in chapter 10, verse 44, this is while Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. And the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. And so here's this idea where now even the Romans are allowed to be a part of this. And then we get this account in Acts chapter 11 uh, of this church in Antioch, which was the first multi-ethnic international church where the name Christian is first said. And so in chapters 8 through 12, there's this big theme that all are welcome to come and find a new belonging, find their identity, find their purpose as they're invited into this family uh, that God has started in the church um, as he's 
remember it's going all the way back once again i know i say this a lot but once again to the promises of abraham that god was going to build a new kind of humanity that was going to live to be a blessing upon all the nations and that has uh been able to happen because of jesus and now look we're seeing how all the nations are now coming and bowing before jesus as their messiah we see it in the samaritans uh those who once were considered outcasts and abominations they're they're being invited in we see it in Saul, even those who, you know, were enemies of the, the state of the church, they're invited in. We get the Roman centurions, those who are seen as the giant oppressors over uh, and those who are seen as the great enemy to God, right? Even they're invited in. And now we see that there's a new kind of community that's operating differently than any other community or organization in its day where here is a group that's multi-ethnic which was not heard of in that first century world here's a multi-ethnic community that's gathering together that's letting go of their former ties and loyalties and submitting their life to follow jesus and it's a radical statement that's being made in, in chapters 8 through 12. Coming out of chapter 12 of the book of Acts and Luke's big argument of how inclusive the church was, he, he zones in on one particular individual, primarily the Apostle Paul, who formerly was known as Saul of Tarsus. And he starts to follow Paul's missionary journey as he's sent out by the church to go and reach the Gentiles with this message. Now, Paul was not the only missionary of that day and age, and so we cannot just assume, okay, he's the only one on this mission by himself. Um, but uh, Luke is primarily focusing on Paul, partially because it's believed that he traveled with Paul, and so he's given firsthand account to a lot of the stories, um, but also because of what Paul was doing. Paul went from place to place, to city to city, and he would first encounter the Jews there, present the gospel to them, and then eventually when he gets rejected by them, then he would go to the Gentiles. And his model was he would spend about three years or so in each city he went to, uh, planted a small little church, got them established, got them new leadership, and then he would leave to go start a church somewhere else. And so he's traveling from one place to the next. And so the stories after the book of Acts chapter 12 are all these accounts of Paul going from one place to the next. And some of them are very exciting. Some of them, uh, he's unsuccessful. Some of them, he goes there and riots happen. Um, but basically what we're seeing is here is the church on mission, where beforehand the church was forced to spread out of threat of safety. And now they're taking the initiative and they're actually going out to reach the ends of the earth. Remember, that was the big uh, roadmap that Jesus gave them. He's like, start in Jerusalem um, and then go to Judea and Samaria and then eventually go out to the ends of the earth. And so now we're in kind of phase three. And how is this mission on the, the shoulders of Paul and other missionaries, how is this mission now going out of people going out to share the good news of Jesus as the Messiah? Now, as this Jesus movement is spreading to all the nations and we get all different people groups who are, are starting to accept this message, it really presents a big question. What does it look like to be a Christian? And that's where we get chapter 15 of the book of Acts. And what happens is the church gathers together with its uh, top leaders, those who are the early disciples of Jesus, plus those who have risen up in popularity, such as Paul and James and Barnabas and all of them. They're all brought together and they have this big council meeting to try to figure out what does it mean to, to be a Christian? Because the big question was, all these new converts, do we convert them to Judaism? Do we enforce these uh, Jewish laws over people who did not grow up in this culture? And part of that had to do with circumcision. And so here's this big dilemma of, well, what does it mean to be a Christian? What does it mean to follow in this uh, path that Jesus has carved out for us? And as we are now bringing people who aren't Jewish into this community, well, do they have to become more Jewish or do we have to become more Gentile-like? Like, what is the standard that, that we need to have? And so what's decided in this, in Acts chapter 15, is a groundbreaking decision that being part of God's new covenant family was not based on race or ethnicity, like it was to be a Jew or to be a part of any other people group, but it was about trusting and obeying the teachings of Jesus. Right? So there's Luke, once again, he's echoing out this big message, this big theme he has, 
that God is not putting up barriers and restrictions anymore on people being part of his family. Now the gates are thrown wide open and it doesn't matter what your race or ethnicity is or your gender, but it matters that you trust and obey the teachings of Jesus. And so this is a groundbreaking thing. It's something that we see is constantly argued a lot in Paul's letters, such as Galatians, because this was, while it's groundbreaking, it's difficult to accept at first. And so there's some learning curves that are part of this um, as the culture is shifting internally within the church. But basically what we're seeing is a church that, that wants to see all of the nations come and accept Jesus as the Messiah. Now, while this new community seems something truly beautiful, where it's like, hey, we're all inclusive, we're inviting people to come in, knowing that you're going to be loved, that you're going to be cared for, and all we ask is that you commit to try to live a life according to the, the will of Jesus, to, to love him and to love people like he has loved you. And so as this new community might seem really wonderful, we have to understand that this new community was seen as strange to the rest of the world. Nobody knew what to do with them. I mean, they didn't follow the social and cultural rules, and they proclaimed really dangerous beliefs of Jesus that went against Roman society, right? And so society in Rome was all about a worship of a plurality of deities with understanding that Roman Caesar Augustus was head over all of the deities and over all forces, right? Um, and, and these uh, organizations within Rome survived upon class, they survived upon what your status and your social status, your political status, um, what your ethnicity and race were. And here's this new community that's not obeying by any of those rules. All right. They're, they're doing things a little bit differently. They're not giving to uh, first to, to support uh, temple worship in some places that survived on that, like Ephesus. The city of Ephesus survived on in temple worship, and, and it hurts the economy when people are like, yeah, we don't want to obey that anymore. And that's why you get stories of riots that happen in Ephesus. Uh, but you also see that here's this new community that's making dangerous claims saying, hey, Caesar Augustus is not the true ruler over all of humanity. It's Jesus of Nazareth, that homeless guy that died on a cross. So you can see that statements like this and a way of life like this did not go well in the culture of the day. It, it was a clash of cultures. And so at this point, we start to see that Christians are once again being seen as big threats to the culture, to the economy, to the pagan way of life in towns. Um, and, and so this is a big deal because beforehand, they are already like this in the Jewish circles. The Jews did not like Christians because they saw them as a threat. They saw this people group, the, uh, the sect of uh, Christians as uh, endangering uh, Jewish faith, endangering Jewish culture and customs. Um, and what they believed as the promises of God. They thought, hey, these are Jews who are leaving the faith. We can't allow this. This is risking danger upon all the Jewish nation and our way of life. And so we already knew that they were being persecuted by the Jews. But now we're seeing that in time, the rest of the world starts to treat the Christians the same way. Right. And it's kind of heartbreaking because here's this group of people that you read in the book of Acts and they want to they want to be a blessing to the nations. They want to love and and. Um, uh, bring good into the world, but because of some of their beliefs and statements that they stand upon, it puts them in a clash against the other cultures um, that Rome society was built upon. And it eventually in time leads to this people group of being um, hated and eventually hunted even. So this growing tension that we mentioned uh, in a previous slide that's happening within the culture around the, the Christian church it really is shown very well in the account of what happens with Paul. So Paul, um, he's been going around planting churches, but he's got this big dream. He wants to go to Rome. And the reason why he wants to go to Rome is because he wants to plant a church there. Because Rome was the capital of the world. And he was thinking, man, if I can get to the capital of the world and I can plant a church there and change the heart of, of Rome uh, to worship Jesus as the Messiah, that will spread out to affecting the rest of the world. And so he has his big heart to go to Rome. And every time he tries to go there, the door gets slammed in his face. But he still has this desire to go there. And he will, just not in the manner which he expected, right? 
Um, and so it starts out where he goes to Jerusalem. And the reason why he in turn goes to Jerusalem rather than Rome is because Jerusalem was facing a dire famine. Um, the people were starving. And so Paul has been going around to all the churches he's planted. He's been collecting donations. He's taken it back to Jerusalem to help the Christians that are there. And while he's there, he gets arrested by the Jews. They, they start a riot. Um, they frame charges against him. They try to kill him. Um, and ironically, he's actually saved by Roman soldiers. But then he's brought into several trials, um, one after another, and there's a lot of shady stuff that happens. Um, you know, some people are, are only keeping him uh, to try to get money out of him. Basically, I think they heard that he had brought all this money in and they want a taste of that um, themselves in order to release him. So even though he goes through one trial after another and he's always found innocent, He's not released from prison. He's just forced to go through another trial until eventually he has to make his case as a Roman citizen saying, I want to be trialed in front of Caesar Augustus, right? He's tired of all these uh, officials who are basically trying to scam him out of money um, and try to uh, get him to bend to their wills that he eventually has to make his case saying, I'm a Roman citizen. I have the right to have my case seen and heard by Caesar. And so that's what's agreed upon. And he gets put on a boat and he gets shipped out to, to Rome. And, and this is an important time frame because while he now enters Rome, it's not in the way he expected. He thought he would be able to enter in as a citizen, but he enters Rome in chains. And he's not free to go around preaching. He's uh, in, under house arrest. But he uses this time to write much of the New Testament letters. And so when we open the Bible, we get past the book of Acts Many of the letters, not all of them, but many of them were written while Paul was in prison. While he was awaiting for the trial of his life to see Caesar, he's writing what we now have as the New Testament. So maybe in some ways uh, for later day culture, it was a, a blessing to those after Paul that he was in prison, that he was forced to slow down and uh, grab a pen and paper and start to write. So we find now Paul is in Rome, and it's rather interesting his location. He's at the heartbed of the Roman Empire, the place where Caesar made decisions as uh, emperor that affected all of the known world. And he's and Caesar's claiming to be a god, and right at his feet, at his doorstep, is Paul, uh, a prisoner, talking about the Messiah. And he's converting people. He's starting churches. He's inviting people into his home. He's sharing the, the good news. It's really an ironic ending, and it's kind of pointing to this fact that, remember, Jesus has said, hey, go to the ends of the earth? Well, Luke is kind of talking. He says, look, Paul is now at the ends of the earth, and he's there, and he's presenting the gospel. And then Luke ends his book in a rather strange way. It's in chapter 28, verse 30, where he's talking about Paul. He says, Paul lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. And then Luke just ends. And it's not a true ending. I mean, think about it from Paul's perspective. Paul is in this situation. He's awaiting his trial before Caesar. He's awaiting what church history says will eventually be his own execution. But Luke doesn't tell us that. He just ends with, and there's Paul. And he's, look, he's still preaching. And it's not a true ending, and that's kind of the point, because Luke is trying to communicate something very powerful at the end of his story that, that shapes uh, what his readers will hopefully uh, go out and do next. And to find that, let's turn to the next slide, and I'll tell you what that is. And here's what Luke is trying to do. As he has ended his story with not a true ending, just kind of like a sentence that almost seems like it's not fully complete. He just leaves it hanging there. He has the intention that his readers would see not just how God's kingdom continues to spread and grow through remarkable means of faithfulness and seen in the apostles and seen in, in those like Stephen and seen in those who take this gospel to places where they're not accepted, where they're uh, facing risks to their own life, is they're, they're choosing to be faithful. And in that, they see how God's kingdom spreads and grows. Luke doesn't only want to record that event, but he has the intention that his readers, you and I even today, 
would see ourselves as responsible for carrying the story forward. It's kind of like he's standing there and he's like, hey, I've written this story, but it's not complete. Here it is for you to finish. Think about it like this. Um, okay, so I'm a big Lord of the Rings fan. Uh, and if you've ever seen the movies, at the very end of the Return of the King, um, or uh, you get this moment where Frodo, he's writing in that book um, he was given to by uh, Bilbo Baggins. He's writing now the Lord of the Rings story. And then he hands it off to Sam and he tells Sam, there's still a few more pages empty waiting for you to add your own story to this. And that's kind of the point that's going on here. Luke has written this with a few blank pages left and he's inviting his readers to see themselves as part of the story and responsible for carrying the story forward. Now what we find in church history is that the readers of Luke's um, account of the life of Jesus, the biography, the gospel of Jesus, and of the Acts of the Apostles, they really carry this forward, uh, this message forward. Um, and we see that the church kind of grows in really three formats, by sharing the good news in word and action, uh, by forming diverse communities where people are treated as equals, and then they're trusting in the power and guidance of God's spirit. We see that throughout the book of Acts, and that's how the church continued to spread uh, even to today. Now, as we end this lecture, let me go ahead and do a quick recap and focus upon really three big highlights that are really crucial for us to understand what the book of Acts is about and how it carries forward the message of the Gospels. So the combination of the Gospels and the book of Acts show us how God's kingdom came on earth as in heaven through Jesus and his spirit and his church. And so this is about this big rescue plan that God has been promising in the Old Testament that is now taking place in the present, where the God's hopeful promises of the future are, are in tasting in the moment of now because here's this Jesus who walked on the scene and he's invited people to come and taste now. What does it mean to, to follow God? What does it mean to love God um, and to listen to him? Now, we also see in this that Jesus grows his new community from 12 to countless by those who faithfully follow his teaching and share his good work. And that teaching, remember, focused primarily upon loving God, listening to him, and loving people as Jesus has loved them. And they share his good word that Jesus is now on the throne. He's the Messiah. He's setting the world right. He is the one who has all authority. And he's inviting people to surrender their lives to the the will and the authority of Jesus. We also see in this account that the Jesus community is a multi-ethnic community of equals that act as God's new temple in this world, and they follow Jesus as the true ruler of the world. And so this is kind of the big dynamics of what we end the book of Acts with, um, and what kind of leads into even today's standard that this is what um, the church, according to the book of Acts, is, is to be modeled after, that they're uh, they're seeking to uh, follow Jesus, to, to follow his teaching, share his good word, um, and, and to be a, a people who um, are inviting others into this, to, to be part of God's new temple and follow Jesus as the true ruler of the world. Before we end this lecture, let me go ahead and remind you of your next assignment. So you have another weekly paper due. Uh, by this point, you should be familiar with how this works. So for this one, you're going to be covering Romans chapters 1 through 3. Um, and you're going to be discussing how, in your opinion, that might influence a Christian worldview based on what you read. Also cover five new chapters from the Complete Bible and Answer book as part of your paper. Be reading Case for Christ. If you have not started that yet, you really need to start that and like cram that in because the paper is due a week after the final class. So make sure that you're doing that. Otherwise, you will not pass this class. You're also going to need to submit two more thought-provoking questions on the discussion board, as well as engage with the other um, classmates and their questions. Uh, once again, be thoughtful, be courteous to one another. You also have an oral presentation due next class. So um, because this is an online class, I've discussed prior how I want that done. Uh, you can send that as a YouTube video. Um, you can send your own PowerPoint with an audio overlap. Um, but that is based on a particular chapter of your choosing from the Complete Bible Answer Book. 
You should have already messaged me of what chapter you're wanting to do. If not, and you haven't to sleep through that, and you still want to do this assignment and get a grade on this, please message me what chapter you're doing, um, and then send me your oral presentation by the start of next week's class. All right, that's it. So for now, um, until next lecture next week, have a good week.